last few weeks, you'll know we've been spending a few weeks in the life of Jonah. Now, if you haven't been here, I'll just recap a little bit of where we're up to till this point. Now, Jonah was a prophet of God, and God came to Jonah and he said to him, Listen, Jonah, I need you to go to the city of Nineveh and I need you to tell them to repent. Jonah said, what? No, that's right. And he hopped on a ship that was heading in the other direction. And then God sent a storm. And the sailors are like, what's going on? There's something going on. It must be that guy Jonah's fault. And so they get Jonah and they throw him overboard. And he does a triple somersault with Pike and lands very neatly into the ocean. And then along comes... What comes? A great big fish. And literally the fish eats him. And Jonah's like, okay God, I'm sorry, I'll stop running. Just get me out of this fish. Three days later, the fish spits Jonah out. And God gives Jonah a second chance. And so Jonah makes his way to Nineveh. And it's this huge, evil city, about 120,000 people. A cultural epicenter in the Assyrian Empire. And Jonah walks into the city and he lets them have it. He says, 40 days and it's all over. 40 days and Nineveh is going to be completely destroyed. And then, unbelievably, led by their king, the whole city falls on their knees and repents. They say, God, forgive us of our sins, forgive us for our vile, evil ways. God, we want to be who it is that you created us to be. Now, can you imagine how Jonah must be feeling? He's run away from God, he's been given this second chance, and he obeys it, and over a hundred and 20,000 people repent. Can you imagine how that must have made Jonah feel? Can you imagine the sheer exhilaration that he must have been feeling? 120,000 people. Now, the population of the whole of Wildshire is about 140,000. So almost pretty close to the population of the entire of Wildshire turns from their evil ways and repents. I reckon Jonah must have been feeling pretty good. You can imagine him just falling on his knees, can't you? And praising God. God, thank you for using me. Look what you've done. So let's turn to Jonah chapter 4. If you've got your Bibles, you can just open them up because we're going to sort of move slowly through it. And read about what comes next. Now, remember that Jonah chapter 3... Ended this way. Verse 10 of Jonah chapter 3 says, When God saw what they had done, they meaning the Ninevites, and how they put a stop to their evil ways, he changed his mind and did not carry out the destruction that he had threatened. Now read on. Jonah chapter 4 verse 1. This change of plans greatly upset Jonah and he became very angry. What? You'd think this would have been a big win for Jonah, wouldn't you? Can you imagine what would happen if I preached and the whole of Wildshire was dramatically converted overnight? It'd be on the news. We'd be going woo, wouldn't we? It'd be on the news. I'd be booked to speak in every Christian conference all over the world, I reckon. You wouldn't see me. I'd be on the front cover of the Woman's Weekly. I'd be on Sunrise. Mel Gibson would probably give me a call about a movie deal. You'd think that Jonah would be celebrating, wouldn't you? Praising God. But that's not how Jonah responded. He was angry. He was mad. He was greatly upset. When Jonah saw that Nineveh had repented, and he realised that God wasn't going to destroy them, he got angry. 
Let's continue on and let's see how Jonah deals with this anger. Verses 2 and 3. So he complained to the Lord about it. Didn't I say before I left home that you do this, Lord? This is why I ran away to Tarshish. I knew that you're a merciful and a compassionate God, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. You're eager to turn back from destroying people. Just kill me now, Lord. I'd rather be dead than alive if what I predicted will not happen. Now, interestingly, if you look in the four chapters of Jonah, you'll notice that there's only two times when Jonah actually talks to God. Now, maybe he did pray in other times, we don't know, but in the whole story, there's only two prayers recorded. The first one was when he was in the belly of the fish, and the second one is now. I know it's been true in my life, and I wonder if it's true for any of you. Do you only pray when tragedy strikes or when you're upset? Do you call out to God when you're sick or when you've lost your job or when you're hurting, but when things are good, not so much? Is that what your relationship with God is like? God has so much more for us. Jesus came not just to rescue us from our pain. He came to give us life, abundant life. Don't settle for a crisis-driven relationship with God. God wants so much more for us. So let's keep going. So Jonah's sitting there, he's angry, he's mad, and he says to the Lord, I knew this would happen. Why do you think I ran to Tarshish? I knew you were going to be merciful and compassionate, forgiving. I knew you'd never destroy them. And then you can feel the depth of Jonah's emotion and how passionate he is about this anger that he's feeling. He says, kill me now. I'd rather be dead than see these evil people not destroyed. It's strong emotion, isn't it? He's angry. He's angry at God. He's angry that God forgave the Ninevites. Do you remember what we said a few weeks ago about the Ninevites? These were evil, barbaric, cruel people. <coughs> remember when they attacked a city? When the word got out that they were coming, it was known that they would torture their captives so brutally, so badly that whole cities would commit suicide rather than risk being attacked by these people. They were feared and they were hated. They were mass murderers and not just mass murderers, but they tortured people in horrific ways. You can read about it in the history. They skinned people alive and buried them in the sand and just horrendous stuff. And it could have been that Jonah had a relative or a friend or someone who'd been murdered or tortured by them. We don't know that, but we do know that he didn't want them saved. He wanted them destroyed. And when they repented, he's mad. Jonah's saying, God, haven't you seen how sick and how corrupt and how evil these people are? I can't believe that you would ever have compassion on them. Really? Jonah's saying, God, thank you for giving me a second chance, but I will never, ever, ever give Nineveh a second chance. God, thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for forgiving my sin. Thank you for forgiving my selfishness. Thank you for forgiving me for running away and not obeying you. Thank you for forgiving me, for giving me forgiveness, but I will never, ever, ever, ever forgive Nineveh. We all do it, don't we? We expect grace for our own mistakes, but we're not so quick to offer grace to the people that hurt us, to the people that let us down. We hang on to resentment and unforgiveness. Thank you, God, for forgiving me, but I will never, ever, ever forget or forgive.
forgive that hurt. It's just way too deep. Here's the thing. The Bible says we have to forgive. God has called us to forgive. Unforgiveness is bondage. It ties you up. Forgive and you're free. When Jesus was hanging on the cross, he'd been abandoned. He'd been abused. He'd been lied about. He'd been slandered. He'd been spit in the face. He'd been hit. And what did he do? What was his response? His response was, Father, forgive them. Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. You read Matthew 16, Jesus hits this topic head on. He says, For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. With the measure that you sow, that's what you'll reap. So you sow meanness, unforgiveness, bitterness, resentment, that's what you'll reap. You'll end up me, bitter, angry, bound up. I've seen it over and over again, and I've seen it in my own life. We have to forgive. We have to forgive unconditionally. It hurts. It's painful. It's hard, and we can't do it in our own strength. But the Holy Spirit in us is powerful when we are weak. We forgive because... <coughs> We're forgiven. Is there someone that you need to forgive? If there is, talk to someone about it. Get some prayer support. Ask God to help you, but you need to do it. It will bring you incredible freedom. But Jonah's not interested in that concept right now. He's pretty angry, and so God looks at him. And he looks into his life and he tries to engage Jonah in a conversation. Here's what it says in verse 4. The Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry about this? So God says, now Jonah, come on, over 120,000 people repented and you're angry and you're bitter. Let's celebrate what's happening here. And he's waiting for Jonah to come back and say, God, you're right. Forgive me for my arrogance. But Jonah's not there. Verse 5 says, Then Jonah went out to the east side of the city and made a shelter to sit under as he waited to see what would happen to the city. My grandfather used to have a saying. When he got really mad, he'd say, I'm off. And he'd go, Jonah's off. He's walking away, he's doing the no-talking thing, he's having a little tanty, and he's not getting the answer from God that he likes. And so he says, I'm off, forget you, God, I'm just going to sit over here and I'm going to wait and see what happens. Now at this point, it would have been understandable if God had sent some awful plague to teach Jonah a lesson. We know he can do it, and Jonah certainly deserves it. He could have sent him boils or Please, or any, any number of wonderful things to teach Jonah a lesson, but God doesn't. God's a God of compassion. Then Jonah in verses 6 to 8, this is the most random, you guys would call it random, that means it's just there's no sort of sense to it, it's random. It's a random piece of scripture. Verse 6, and the Lord God arranged for a leafy plant. To grow there. And soon it spread its broad leaves over Jonah's head, shading him from the sun. This eased his discomfort, and Jonah was very grateful for the plant. It says, Then God arranged. Did you notice that? God arranged. Now there's a bit of a theme happening here, so remember that word. God arranged. God arranged for a plant to grow up where Jonah was sitting to shade from the sun. And Jonah was very grateful. You can almost see a little bit of smugness there, can't you? Ha, oh, feeling bad, are you, God? Well, so you should be. Thank you for the plant. I really appreciate that. Now, verses 7 and 8 
um, Alice in Wonderland would have said, it gets curiouser, it gets stranger, it gets randomer. Verse 7, but God also arranged, is the theme, for a worm. The next morning at dawn, the worm ate through the stem of the plant so that it withered away. And as the sun grew hot, God arranged for a scorching east wind to blow on Jonah. The sun beat down on his head until he grew faint and he wished to die. Death is certainly better than living like this, he exclaimed. God's into arranging some very strange things right now. He arranged for a worm to come and to chew through the vine. And then he arranged for a hot wind and scorching sun that burnt poor Jonah's head. And Jonah can't handle it anymore. And look at the depth of his emotion again. He wanted to die. It would be better for me to die than have to live like this. There's a kid's book, and it's called, some of you might remember it, it's called Alexander and the Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day. Does anybody remember that book? No. Oh, some of you do. You need to go to the library. It's a really cool kid's book. Alexander and the Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day. Jonah is having a horrible, no good, very bad day. But here's what we've got to understand. God is the God of the horrible, no good, very bad days. God arranged the vine to shave his head, but God also arranged the worm and the hot wind and the sun. God arranged it. God loved Jonah. He cared about him. And he knew exactly what he needed to send into Jonah's life. And at one time it was a vine to shave his head. Another time it was a storm, a big fish, a worm, a scorching wind. But that's not the God that we want to serve, is it? We want to serve the God of the vine. We want to serve the God that blesses us, the God that makes us happy and comfortable. We want to serve the God that writes a check and sends anonymously the mail to us. We want to serve the God that always heals, that always provides, the God that smiles on us. We want to serve the God of the vine. But the reality is that God is so much bigger than just the God of the vine. He knows us and he loves us enough to specifically send us sometimes a wind or a worm. You know it's true because you've lived it. Our lives are filled with shady vines as well as hot wind and worms, sometimes all in the one day, right? I've been blessed to have godly parents that loved me. I've got a wonderful husband. I've got four great kids. I've known what it's like to earn good money, but also I know what it's like to struggle financially. I know what it's like to feel overwhelmed by the demands that are on me, but I know what it's like to feel carried by God. I know what it's like to be let down by people who you thought were friends. But I know what it's like to be loved and to care for to be cared for by many people. I know what it's like to get a phone call from your doctor. You've got a tumour in your brain. But I also know what it's like to wake up in recovery, frightened, but singing praise to God. God is the God of the vine. He is. But he's also the God of the worm. Sometimes he is thinking about your comfort. But sometimes he's growing your character. He's developing Christ in you. He's developing patience, endurance. He's developing you into the man or the woman that he's called you to be. Now Jonah's a mess. God tries to engage him in dialogue, but he's too angry. Verse 9 says, Then God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry because the plant died? Yes. Jonah retorted, even angry enough to die. Jonah is suicidal over a 
stupid plant. It's ridiculous. But let's cut to the chase. The reality of the whole of this chapter of Jonah is that it's all about Jonah. It's all about Jonah. It's about his anger. It's about his comfort. It's about God taking the vine. It's all about him. And God says, verse 10, that the Lord said, You feel sorry about the plant. Though you did nothing to put it there, it came quickly and it died quickly. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people living in spiritual darkness. Not to mention all the animals. Shouldn't I feel sorry for such a great city? God says, Jonah, actually, it's not about you. Actually, it's about me. It's about my purpose. It's about my glory. And it's about lost people. People who I made. People who I love. People who are lost. I've asked myself this question this week. Ask yourself, is your life all about you? Is it all about you? Is it all about your car? Is it all about your job? Is it all about where you want to eat? Where you want to go? All about your Facebook status? All about the fact that you're married? Or the fact that you're not married? All about your comfort? Your money? Your lack of money? Jonah's miserable because he's lost his plant. But God says, Jonah, it's not about you. It's not about your anger. It's not about your unforgiveness. Life is about me, and it's about Nineveh. 120,000 perishing people. About the population of Lyleshire. Guys, it's not about us. It's not. It's about God. And about people out there who are dying. We live in a community where marriages are falling apart. Where kids don't have dads. Where homeless people don't have food. They don't have shelter. We live in a community where people are lonely. They're fearful of the future. They're living for their next fix. We live in a community where people live for football or for surfing or for Friday nights at the club. They're dying. Thousands of them all around us. It's not about us. It's not about our comfort. God's heart was breaking for a city full of people that were dying. He sent his servant Jonah. Jonah obeyed, but he still didn't get it. He was too caught up in his own emotions and his own feeling and his own comfort. Life is not about us. It's about God and dying people. And life is short. It's short. We said it last week. We don't know how long it is before we will stand before God and have to give account for what we've done with what he gave us in the time that we were here on earth. Touch somebody's life. Make a difference. Go to Nineveh. Invite your neighbour over for dinner. Build a relationship with the guy on the train. Share your faith at school. Hang out with the people in the footy club or the soccer club. Show grace to someone who doesn't deserve it. Life is not about you. It's about God and about dying people. God is sending us to Nineveh. Are we going to go? Let's pray again. Lord, we're so sorry for the way that we get so caught up in our own lives, in our own comfort, and we forget that Nineveh is all around us. Thousands and thousands.
thousands of dying people. Lord, you sent us out, each one of us here. You've sent us out into our neighbourhoods, our schools, our unis, our workplaces. May we be people who serve you, who obey you, who follow you, whatever the cost. So that lost people might find the hope and forgiveness and joy that is only to be found by knowing you.